Hello. Ever thought about what you would do in a hospital if faced with a catastrophic medical crisis of a loved one? I hadn't until my life changed in the blink of an eye. We were on vacation, summertime. One of our five children, our 17-year-old son, ran down the beach into the ocean and dove into a big wave and also into an unknown sandbar, shattering his neck, rendering him an instant quadriplegic paralyzed from the neck down. In that moment, our lives changed forever. And I got an inside look at hospital life as I lived bedside to our son and worked side by side with nurses and doctors in three different intensive care units across the country over six months. Our son died two times and lived. And there were many things I learned. When you face a crisis requiring intensive medical care, short term or long term, and you want to survive and thrive after it, I have one message for you. Be a trauma informed relational advocate, which means you need to engage as a partner with medical staff and bring an unwavering hope in what is possible. I want you to be trauma informed and know that when it is your child, spouse, or parent in medical crisis, you too are likely experiencing trauma. That initial feeling of disbelief, overwhelm, or even collapsing are all normal and indeed are intelligent responses of your brain trying to protect you from a shocking event. But you're not in optimal decision-making mode at that time. So when you arrive at the hospital, it's okay to ask the medical staff to write basic information down for you, their names, and any procedure they're asking for your consent. Decide ahead of time whom you will call to be with you because you'll need to have someone there with you so that you can be there for your loved one. And when you step foot into a hospital, you are entering a different ecosystem where each doctor or nurse or tech is a specialist practicing in their specialized medical silo. Your loved one needs you to navigate these medical silos. So once you gain yourself, Reach out and create a circle of support for yourself and your loved one so you can then focus on being a communication broker between the siloed specialists. As you navigate and advocate, know that there are longer-term impacts of trauma, like feeling numb, hypervigilant, or hyperreactive if you're not supported through the trauma experience. As a mediator of many years, you will need to think like a mediator to help the specialists talk with each other. Ask each specialist to translate into non-medical ease, whatever they're doing, so you can understand it. Repeat it back, write it down. They like this because it shows you care and they can show you what they know. You like this because you learn and you can share accurate information between the silos. It also gives the experts a chance to think more fully about what they're doing or recommending. Ask them if you can record conversations on your smartphone. Take pictures of x-rays and MRIs. Keep a medical journal, a notebook, with columns for the dates, times, doctor's names, when medications are given or procedures are performed. And refer to these often and share them between the silos. Specialists love all this because they don't get the chance to collaborate with each other. And it creates a two or three heads are better than one outcome for your loved one. And if you wonder more than once about anything, ask. It's so important to stay alert in hospitals 
and trust your intuition and hunches. It may even save your loved one's life. You see, medical errors happen all the time in hospitals. According to the 2021 report of the National Institutes of Health, medical errors are a leading cause of death in the United States and a serious public health problem. The more complicated the situation, the more likely, and the more routine, the more likely. Wrong medications, ventilator pneumonia, central line IV bloodstream infections, uncoordinated care. Every year, approximately 400,000 hospitalized patients experience some type of preventable harm. The hospital ecosystem relies on standard procedures to prevent harm, but they can be so routine that staff do not pay full attention. And patients are often passive, deferring, and not meaningfully engaged. So partner with the medical staff by reading every label of every medication, including drip bags, every time. Most staff welcome this quality control check. Be the extra set of eyes the overworked staff cannot be because they cannot stay bedside to your loved one to see what you see. So if you can arrange it, stay bedside 24 seven and have others alternate with you. So you can report the nuances you see in your loved one like variations in breathing, changes in skin pallor, and certain looks in your loved one's eyes. As a relational advocate, you're also going to need some conflict transformation skills because there's bound to be some conflict. It's human. Here are some of my favorite mediator interventions adapted for hospitals. Okay, ask the staff for family meetings and turn the doctor's daily rounds in the hallways into interactive experiences bedside with you and your loved one. Listen to understand, ask questions, and use the reflection skill a lot. The reflection skill is where you mirror back to the speaker what the speaker just said in their own words, their facts, their feelings. Oh, it's especially effective when you don't understand, or if you disagree or don't like what you hear. It's the daily skill set that I've been teaching for over 30 years, and I found it to be very effective in hospitals. It goes like this. Every time a specialist enters your hospital room, view yourself as a partner and engage with them. Ask them what they think, because doctors are very cerebral. How do you think my loved one is doing? What are your thoughts about potential complications from this upcoming surgery? And listen carefully, and then reflect back to them exactly what they said to you in their words, not yours. This gives them a chance to hear themselves. I found when I did this every time, the doctor or nurse elaborated or modified or edited what they had said. They became more thoughtful, more complete in their answers and more problem solving. The reflection skill also gives medical staff the opportunity to pay closer attention to routine standard procedures, which can prevent errors. And if you're still wondering or unsettled about what medical staff have said, you might add one of my mediator favorites, the open question, how come? It's a gentle way of asking why. If a doctor changes a medication or recommends a new surgery or procedure, or a nurse bumps the settings up or down on a device, you could ask, why did you do that? But because the ecosystem is used to patients deferring to their medical expertise, you 
might be perceived as challenging them, which begs a defensive response. And you don't want that. Asking how come, on the other hand, is a question of curiosity. And it comes from a caring ethic. How come invites a doctor to think harder about a procedure to consider alternatives or unintended consequences with other parts of the body outside their narrow expertise. They might realize they need more information. It may not be the exact right procedure and it may not even be necessary. When our son Archer was restricted from water for days after each general anesthesia surgery, I asked, how come? Maybe his water intake was restricted because of potential medical complications. Maybe it was restricted for liability, offense reasons. I mean, water is certainly not restricted as a matter of pain management or comfort. He was miserable. I described to the nurse his almost reptilian thrashing and begging for even a drop of water. Yes. I knew he was hydrated on IVs, but wasn't there some other way to give him some water in his mouth? A washcloth soaked with water I could put on the insides of his cheek or even brush on his lips. Her answer was no water. It's routine procedure. So I reflected it's routine procedure. And I again asked, how come? The nurse paused, thought about it more, and this is what unfolded. It was more the rate of ingestion of water that they were concerned about and Archer's choking. Well, I was concerned about that too, but couldn't we do a few slow drops? Yes. She thought she could look for some tiny ice cube water balls on sticks, which she did. And we called them lollipops. And they brought Archer great comfort. And we were all better partners for it. You know, most nurses care deeply about helping people. And most doctors go to medical school because they care deeply about human life and well-being. The caring ethic can get lost though amidst hospital regulations, competition and litigation and secondary trauma. But you can create an emotional connection and rekindle the caring ethic by painting the picture of who your loved one is in the eyes of the staff. After all, they might only see another very sick patient in pain in a hospital gown under a sheet hooked up to monitors and tubes. I told every surgeon, every nurse, every specialist, see that boy in that bed? He is six foot three and he just turned 17. He's a strong athlete, a beautiful portrait artist and an A student and he has tons of friends, three brothers and a sister who adore him. He's going to paint again and he's going to walk one day. We need your help to make that happen. I put up a prayer for a creative miracle that our son would be fully restored. All things are possible. And I hung it on the door. And for those doctors afraid to be optimistic because of false expectations, give them permission to be hopeful by your being the voice of hope that they think they cannot be. I talked with staff regularly about our belief in healing, in the divine, our belief in recovery, our belief in future scientific breakthroughs, our belief in miracles. Tell surgeons you believe in them. Tell nurses and techs you appreciate them. Your gratitude will raise the vibration for healing. And you can also create a physical environment that lifts the healing vibration too 
by transforming your hospital room into a healing sanctuary for your loved one. And it also doubles as an oasis for staff, for respite and rejuvenation. After all, hospital staff working every day with medical trauma and traumatized family members are also likely experiencing secondary trauma. There's been a profusion of research in the noetic sciences telling us that images of nature, happy memories, gentle aromatic smells, soft sounds, and natural rhythms are conducive for physically healing the body. You can order from the hospital pharmacy essential oils like frankincense, which lifts the spirit and you can put them into styrofoam hospital cups to transform the air in your room. Turn off the TV, play soft nature music, and reclaim the natural circadian rhythm of the body by opening the shades during the day and turning off the lights at night so your loved one's body can re-regulate and begin to heal itself. Why not? bring this trauma healing wisdom into your loved one's hospital room. You can create a new energy for healing in hospitals when you are trauma informed and you can change the quality of care for your loved one when you engage the medical silos as a partner and your hope can inspire their hope so that what is possible thinking becomes the norm. Become a relational advocate for your loved one in the hospital. It may be your finest moment. <laughs>